Oh, do you guys want me to like promote this at all or share it? Uh, yeah, you're doing, you're doing that right now. <laughs> yeah. um, they can hear you. It's okay. Oh. Oh. Um, but yeah, if you can uh, um, uh, just go to the page on Facebook and grab the link and push that out would be great. Got it. All right, welcome back to Mises Pack Money Bomb live stream number seven. I think it is. Um, I, they're all blurring together for me. I've been at this since noon. Uh, but the good news is, is we have uh, we're within shout. We're almost kind of almost to four hundred. I think uh, if we get ten or fifteen or so more this hour, we'll be past four hundred recurring monthly donors. Uh, which was one of our goals for today. We're already over $5,000 per month. Um, so you can get on board at $5 a month at 500. We've got those two things and everybody in between. 400. 400. Oh, I, I thought we had a 500. I was looking at the data. Uh, that, would, that would take you over the yearly maximum because the rules uh, around all of, this are amazing. Yeah. That's, oh, it's 5,000 per year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, um, uh, why you want to, another reason you want to become a recurring monthly donor, in addition to just helping Mises pack is, uh, to get a chance to win one of the two silver rounds we have left, or of course the AR 15, which, uh, you know, we showed you the, vi the great video of that last hour, uh, the stopper of riots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, I'm not really much of a gun guy, but that was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so um, lpmesiscaucus.com slash donate. Another thing you can do to help is, uh, like Dave did, you might've heard him earlier, uh, share it on your page to your, to your friends, whatever, uh, people who might be interested, uh, like, and comment on the, uh, uh, on the stream. And if you have a good comment, I'll put it up and, uh, just get some buzz going and, uh, and, and donate while you're at it. Um, I've I, got, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, I've got, I've got one small announcement uh, oh, yeah, before, we, before we get into it with Dave Smith. Uh, so one thing that we are bringing back as a Mises Caucus, you know, we have all these things. We have the PAC, and we use that to support candidates. We use that to support causes. We have the, uh, the grassroots movement. We have organizer teams in almost every single state. Now we're up to almost three-person organizing teams in almost every single state, uh, almost 200 uh, volunteers across the country. Uh, we've got the Decentralized Revolution podcast that Aaron uh, uh, hosts. But now we're bringing back the other podcast that we did for a little bit, but then I kind of neglected. Um, we're doing Ask an Austrian. So if you go to askanaustrian.com, there will be a form there for you to fill out. You can ask any question that you've got uh, about libertarian theory or Austrian economics. And then we will have somebody from the Mises Institute take your questions and answer them live on – well, not live, sorry, but pre-recorded on camera. And we will be putting that out. And who better to kick that back off than Bob Murphy? So we got Bob Murphy. He's going to take your questions on Austrian economics. I think he might have an answer for them. And uh, we'll be putting that back out. So ask at Austrian.com, submit your questions, take human action.com, submit your bag, get the eater, take human action. 
All right. I'm, uh, my wife has cooked me dinner, so I'm going downstairs uh, to take care of that and, and uh, uh, not completely ignore her for the whole day. Uh, but I'll be back before toward the end of this, uh, this stream in a half hour or so. Okay, guys? All right. All right go to it. So, so we were talking a little bit before we got started. And you were saying you, you're going into New York here uh, a couple times a week. What, what exactly has all of this done to New York? Well, well, first of all, actually, let me, let me, I'm, I'm sorry. We are with the great, the fantastic, the illustrious Dave Smith. I always I really go, just sir. throw all of those compliments out, hoping one day they'll come back to me. So thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Michael. And it's good to be with you. And it was good to talk with Aaron briefly. And I think that is a, uh, that is a, a very wise move to go spend a little bit of time with his wife since I've been I've been watching you guys uh, in and out all day. So I know you've been going hard. Um, so, yeah, New, New York City is. Um, so, at, so I grew up in New York in the 80s and 90s. Um, I mean, I was born in 83. So, you know, the 80s were the early part of my life. But I, I remember rugged, kind of dangerous New York City. And the last 25 years have really just been, I, I think almost every year crime has dropped and property values have gone up. And so it's a real crazy thing to see that bubble kind of popped. I don't mean that in the Austrian sense, just in the sense of like, you know, like it's, it, this has changed. And um, going back there now, man, it's so weird seeing everybody's in masks, uh, businesses are boarded up. Um, the, the homeless problem is really out of control. It looks a lot more like Los Angeles or San Francisco has looked over the last few years. And, uh, there, and, and it's, it's depressing and people are bailing out of the city left and right. Um, I've, I've heard that, uh, moving companies can't meet the demand because people want to leave so much, uh, where I used to live on, on the Upper West Side is, is kind of like a wealthier area of the city. About 40% of it, of the, of that area is gone. Now, not all of them have flee, uh, have fled, but they're at their summer homes and things like that. But the, the neighborhood is just like decimated. And now they, they, they have these crazy programs. Uh, Mayor de Blasio has, uh, essentially, not rented out, but they've paid to uh, fill up three hotels with homeless people um, from from around the city. Uh, they're they're paying about two hundred bucks a room a night to these hotels, uh, who I, I'd imagine are desperate for the business to just uh, fill them up, uh, basically make them homeless shelters, fill them up with homeless people in the middle of this really nice family neighborhood. And the, you know, 40% of the neighborhood, the, the wealthier part are all gone at their, you know, vacation homes or summer homes or whatever. And uh, the, the rest of the people who are there are just having to deal with this. And it's, um, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's tragic. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a sad situation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, I think, for people because I, I don't live in the city and I've never lived in the city. I, I never want to live in the city. Um, <laughs> I think it's, it's hard for people to kind of, who, who haven't grown up in that to really understand the devastation. You know what I mean? I mean, it sounds like it's completely different, completely wiped out. You're having this mass exodus and it seems like a very uncertain future. You know what I mean? How are they going to recover from this in any sense? Like financially, uh, I mean, all these people are leaving jobs wise, people are already leaving in mass numbers because of the job situation, the regulatory situation. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know if there's going to be any coming back. Yeah, you know, so uh, so de Blasio has had this program for the last couple months um, where they've allowed restaurants, they've given them licenses. This is the most status shit you'll ever hear in your life, right? So they've given them licenses to be able to have table seating in the street right in front of their restaurant. So you can't have people in your restaurant, but you can you can sit in the street, in a New York City street as appealing as that sounds to have have a meal uh, with the rats running around by your feet and stuff uh, so that they can sit there. And now uh, how status is this? And he's bragging about how many jobs they've created <laughs> by doing this. So in other words, you know, you put 100 percent of the wait staff out of business and then you have this other you know program that lets 20 percent of them come back to work and you go, look, we've created this many yeah. jobs. Um, and he just said a couple weeks ago that he's going to continue the program next summer. Wow. So he already has it in his mind 
that we're doing this for at least another year. And it's really, it's blowing my mind that like, even forget the, like libertarianism and all the stuff that we stand for, just the fact that any regular normal people are willing to accept that we're just gonna do this for another year is really, uh, it's it's just, it, it's, it's hard to imagine that this is reality. It's a, it's a lesson if you ask me, because everyone, you know, everyone thinks that not that not that we're in Nazi Germany times or everything, but everybody always says, oh, that would never be me. You know, if things like that were happening here. That would never be me. And I would never go along with that. I'd be the brave one. I would fight. I would do. Blah, 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 blah. And yet here we are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, we're not quite Nazi Germany, but we are, you know, shutting cities down, letting it be taken over by mobs, all this stuff. And and we're like, you're, you're like, I think you've talked about this. You're like shamed into if you point it out, yeah. you know. Yeah, so, it's it's, no, it's, a, it's a really good point. And obviously, yeah, it's not we're not Nazi Germany or North Korea or something like, you know, uh, some horrific totalitarian uh, society. But you do see elements of those societies being used. And that's worth kind of noting. And yeah, there there is something to the fact that when you kind of, you know, Tom Woods in his uh, great book, Real Descent, which if you haven't read, everyone should read illustrious it. Illustrious book. Illustrious book. It's a it's a Tom Woods non ebook. Okay, that's how good <laughs> this thing is. It was printed on actual paper made from trees. And one of the things that he said, which is like one of the, one of the best things I've ever read in my life, and I'll probably butcher uh, retelling it, but he said basically that if you're against slavery in the year 2015 when he wrote the book he was like that that's meaningless it's like yeah. everyone's against slavery it, it doesn't take any courage there's no threat of slavery coming back and so it's you're basically just a useless person to be out there saying i'm against slavery but if you were against slavery in 1840 that really meant something. It was dangerous. Abolitionists were lynched. Slavery yep. was actually an institution that existed. So the, the question becomes, what are you willing to, to stand up against that will actually have negative consequences? And I, I will say that I think the, the Mises Caucus, it, it, out of anyone in the Libertarian Party, passes that test the most. And the biggest critics of, of the Mises Caucus I would just say, I, I would ask you in, a, in an honest way, what brave position do any of them take? What position do they take that could actually get you in trouble, get you kicked off Twitter? We're not even talking about being lynched publicly, but what, what <laughs> position do they take that would, you know, like really offend the New York Times or anything? And, and the answer is usually pretty much nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we... We started off as kind of a rebellion. I mean, we're still a rebellion. We're changing the party. But when we got started, I mean, we were the ones getting ratioed. At the time, the former chair was very, very popular, you know, and, and we were the first ones to come in and question him. It was when he fought, launched that first salvo against Woods. We had happened to have made the group a few hours earlier that night. That resulted in a flood of people. And now here we are. And, and yeah, but we were the ones getting ratioed. You know, to this day, we are still tarred as the new one is is transphobic that's that's the one that's the the narrative that they're moving to first it was you know they're racist paleos they're republicans they blah 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 and then you know we were bringing in more people of let's say diverse demographics than them they kicked those people out you know right. they canceled them and and you know now we just had the women's panel so now it's it's transphobic and and it just it's never ending you know it's it's never going to end so uh, basically, yeah, you have to be willing to stick your back out there, accept the knives and, and push forward. So, but I want to, I want to transition into the next thing. Cause now we're talking about the party and the caucus and, and, you know, you have become a little bit of a lightning rod in, in upon your, your activity within the party. And, and I want to talk about that because I think it's really interesting. I think you in particular serve a very, not that you're not a part of the Mises caucus, but you are a voice of the movement. And, and, and we are now at this point, we are very invested uh, in the party and, and there's uh, things that come along with that. Whereas one of the problems that we're trying to solve is that the movement is not only not in the party, but they're embarrassed by the party. And if you just ask them, why aren't you in the Libertarian Party? They'll tell you, you know, and, and then I, and that to me, it makes it incumbent upon us as the party to listen to our lowest hanging recruitment fruit, which you don't. So 
I, I guess my, my question is, is you, you, you are, I think you are representing that movement that wants to see the party to change. So what, what's kind of like your commentary on the position that, cause you, you know, you've said recently that you double down on the party, you double down on the caucus. What do you mean by that? And what do you see is like your role versus even that might be a little bit different than my role? Oh yeah. Well, the, we, we certainly have different roles. Um, and so, okay. So what I look, what I care about and the reason why you convinced me to join the libertarian party is because I, so I basically came around, like I was talking about this the other day. I, I started my podcast in late 2012 and then, uh, then ended it and then started again in 2013. And I had no audience. I mean, no audience. I think I got like a, a hundred downloads an episode or something like that. You know, like I was, I was doing loser brigade numbers uh, at the time, <laughs> and the, I, and I just built it up from there. And I what I am still a child of the Ron Paul movement. Happy birthday to the great Ron Paul. And it was it was heartbreaking to me that the Ron Paul movement did not it it listen for everything great that. Ron Paul did, it wasn't the revolution that we wanted it to be. It didn't, it didn't succeed. And as it started to dwindle out year after year, and up until 2016, I was still really hopeful that Rand Paul would keep the movement going and so all of that. I. So I, you know, so as the movement was dwindling, I kind of like was building my audience up. And it was kind of like it, it all worked out for me pretty well. Like I I I've got a great career, man. I've got, I've got a great career. I do everything I love. I have the best wife in the world. I have a perfect little one and a half year old uh, daughter. I love my life. Uh, I don't need to be a part of the Libertarian Party at all. If this whole thing, you know, like collapse tomorrow, I can go back to just doing my podcast and making fun of the cathedral and and point and spreading the message and doing all the shit I do. It doesn't hurt me at all. But when I heard you say that you were ready, and I heard someone smart and passionate and hardworking say, we are reigniting the Ron Paul revolution. That's, I was like, yes, that's what I want to do. I want to be a part of that. So my, my issue is just that I think this is a great thing to do, to try to spread the liberty movement. And if I see uh, a situation where I think this is not going to be good for spreading the liberty movement, then I'm going to address that because that's what I care about. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here. Now, a lot of, like, like I just said, if the whole Libertarian Party just disbanded tomorrow, I'd go back to being exactly who I am. Now, a lot of the people uh, who are critics of ours, if the Libertarian Party disbanded tomorrow, they're done. Like this is their whole identity. It's a, so they're they're a little defensive about me coming in and ruffling feathers. And they're like, well, if this isn't good for the party, then this isn't good for any of us. But what I just said, what I said when I debated Nick Sarwalk is still how I feel. I don't care about the liberty, the, the, the Libertarian Party. What I care about is liberty. And if the Libertarian Party is a vehicle to achieving liberty, then great, I'm all in, like all in, like I'll die with you guys on this hill. But if it's not, then I don't care about it at all. And so when you talk about the liberty movement, not the, the ones who don't want to be a part of the Libertarian Party, I completely understand why. I, do too. I, think, yeah. I think it would serve a lot of people in the Libertarian Party well to listen, actually hear out their criticisms, not dismiss them and say, oh, you know what? Maybe there is maybe there is something to this. Yeah, I mean, I've said this a million times where there, there's a kind of attitude within the party where it's like, well, we're called the Libertarian Party. So if you identify as a libertarian, you are obligated to be here. And, and imagine that, like, imagine that instead of in a political party, in a business, like imagine it's like, I've got this great product and I have it aimed at a, at a target demographic that I think is very likely to buy it. And you're obligated to buy it. And if you don't like the product, that's your fault. That person's not going to be in business very long at all, especially if that, that targeted base turns around and says, yo, your product sucks. You know what I mean? And, and then, and then their response is, no, it doesn't. You suck that done. They're going to be done. And, and that's kind of what, what, in my opinion, has happened here in a large part. And, and there's just been a cultural degradation in the party. Um, and, and I think 
in some ways, this is where the former chair was was right. There's one thing that the former chair used to harp on that was absolutely you son of a bitch. What do we say? <laughs> this is not what I agreed to. <laughs> well, no, no, no. There's one thing that he said that's absolutely true. He just said it in a very arrogant manner because he never thought it would happen. And that is that that uh, the party is made of who shows up. You know what I mean? It really is, and that's true. He just never thought that we would show up, let alone stay, and and become a pack and and do all this stuff. So. So, well, yeah, that, I mean, that's a great point. And that's why I've kind of doubled down my my uh, uh, commitment to the Mises caucus and the Libertarian Party is that I'm just a, I'm, I'm able to see one level beyond what these guys are doing. And I'm just like, well, look, there's no way that these dorks are going to bully me out of being a part of th this movement when I know that we have all of the energy, all of the passion all of, of the um, kind of like grit and hardworking people, and we're right. There's nothing that we are saying that isn't correct here. So I'm not like, look, I know there, are, and this is why I've, I've posted this in the Facebook group a few different times. It's like, guys, understand what's happening here is that we're on the verge of succeeding. We didn't succeed already. And I do think that like there's a fair balance here, okay? The Mises Caucus should, we should feel the sting of of the losses that that we suffered this year we should feel that sting we were very very close to having the mises caucus presidential candidate and the mises caucus chair of the libertarian party that was a very very close and both of those things didn't happen and that that hurts but we also realize we're very very close so you, you have to kind of like take that in for what it is and go okay do you want to keep committing now to going further and when you see a lot of these tactics i mean like silly things but i'm i know what it is like the freaking libertarian party uh twitter account unfollowed me recently <laughs> they, like, like, they, fucking, they don't like what we're doing here and that's fine i have no problem with that but i still think this is the best bet for liberty to stay here and continue to really win the day. And I know people, like I said, take over the party the other day and some people got their panties in a bunch about that. But look, <laughs> this isn't, this isn't, if you're a libertarian, you shouldn't be concerned about me saying we're going to take over the party. When I say take over the party, what I mean is restore the revolution. If you're a hardcore libertarian who loves Austrian economics and loves individual liberty and loves non-aggression, you know, uh, non-interventionist foreign policy, you should be thrilled with this new takeover that's going to happen. It's not like just the Mises caucus taking over. I'm saying the true principles of libertarianism are taking over the libertarian party. And that's what's and happening. And two points on that. One, it's not like we're running some kind of friggin' French revolution. It's not like, okay, chair, dead. You know, now we're installing a Mises caucus chair. Like, we have to earn it. You know what I mean? Even if we did take over, it would only be by votes. It would be by us recruiting more people, about us winning more people over, getting the votes. So even if we did take over, it would it would have to be upon voluntary means. We're not killing anybody, for Christ's sakes, or, or, or seizing the, the, the means of the party or anything like that. And, and second of all, we're winning the argument. Yeah, we're winning the argument. And, and the fact of the matter is, is we have a lot deeper of a well to draw on than than the opposition. Where is the opposition's Tom Woods joining the board, you know, and having the audience that he has? Or where's where's, you know, getting support for someone like you for them and the audience that you have and the ready. You know, I, I, I said it the other day, I think when we were on the phone or yeah, with, with that you're and Tom's audiences ought to be low hanging fruit. Like they, they are that consumer base that I was talking about. And, and we don't treat libertarians like customers. We treat them like they're obligated to be here. And, yes. and, 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 there and, is and a tremendous misconception, I think, about my audience and Tom's audience and me and Tom uh, from a lot of our very dishonest uh, critics within the party. And the truth is that it's not as if that like uh, I'm not looking for the Libertarian Party to run some like culturally right wing candidate. I, I don't think that it would be a smart move for the Libertarian candidate to jump into the culture war on the right wing side of the culture war. I would criticize them if they did that. I think it's a bad idea. I think the idea for a Libertarian par uh, uh, Party candidate is to rise above the culture war, point out how the state has created the culture war and benefits from the culture war and then defuse the 
the situation. The truth is that a lot of people in the like the culture of the Libertarian Party is very left leaning progressive, whether they realize that or not. That is the reality. And so they see anybody who's just not that as right wing. But the truth is that the, the most of Tom Wood's audience, most of my audience, what they're turned off by is not that the libertarian uh, ticket is not on the right wing side of the culture war. They're just they're just sick and tired of placating the left in, in the culture war. And if they just stopped that, there'd be a lot more people who would be willing to jump on board. That's for sure. And and this is one thing we can talk about because I don't know that we 100 percent agree here, but exactly what you're describing is why is the intent behind the identity politics, well, both the identity politics plank and what we call the lifestyles plank. And basically, if you don't, if you're not familiar with that one, the lifestyles plank is basically saying, look, you, the, the way that you live your life, as long as you're abiding by the nap, is an extension of your self-ownership. Nobody cares. You know what I mean? Like nobody cares. But at the same time, we're not down with identity politics. And what we're trying to convey with that is that you can be whoever you want to be. You could technically be an SJW and be in here. You could technically be right wing and be in here. But you've got to put the Austrian shit, the decentralist shit and all that above the culture stuff. You know what I mean? Like that that has to be paramount. So I, I, I think you're kind of saying the same thing. Because basically what I'm saying is don't take a side in the culture war. Oppose it. Oppose it. And 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 and, and show how ridiculous the whole thing is and how it's become a, a rapid race to the bottom. Yeah, well, I think that the to me, look, I I mean, I'm going I think I I'm a commentator and I you know what I mean like this is what I do for for a living and it's impossible to not comment on the culture war uh, right. as it's in the as it's raging. You know what I mean? It's like Well, it's look, it's intertwined with politics because the the, the 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 politics so the, the 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 reason there's a culture war is because of the power of the government. And now you got these two tribes who are battling for cultural supremacy over each other. It's crazy. Yeah, and in a sense it becomes necessary when you have such a big government because I mean, look, when when you have a a big government like this, the, the, the most awesome, you know, uh, uh, powerful government in the history of the world, one side is going to win and the other side is going to live under the rule of the other side. So you better be ready to go to war if, if there's a vastly different culture that's about to rule over you and don't get it twisted. I mean, the culture in Portland is vastly different than the culture in, you know, San Antonio or something like that. Like even, it's, they even- are... Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Even here within Pennsylvania, Lancaster sure. County, there's Amish people and there's horse and buggies rolling down the street. And then you've got Scranton area, which is completely mountainous. And then you have Philly, which is a cesspool. And and like and then all these different suburbs. I mean, it's not even the same within within the same state. Right. Right. And that's yeah, that's true in New York. It's true in New Jersey. I mean, like, yeah, absolutely. And so the, I, I agree in the sense that what makes you a libertarian is that whatever your cultural preferences may be, you're not willing to force those on other people. You're re- you're, you're willing to uh, be be a volunteer, uh, voluntarist and let the chips fall where they may. Uh, like you might win out in the culture, or you might not. And more likely, like as you were just kind of getting at, some areas will be culturally conservative, some areas will be culturally liberal. Um, but I do think it's somewhat impossible to um, to you know like not talk about a lot of this shit. Look, I've never really particularly liked talking about race uh, on my podcast, and anyone who, who listens to me knows that. I, I don't really like to talk, but it's pretty hard to not talk about race at all when there's a Black Lives Matter movement, you know, in every uh, city across the country, and there's like mass protests and riots and looting. Well, the, and the, the, stuff. The, the, the peaceful protests or the movement, everything else is the, the organization. That's right. The uh, I guess, yeah, I yeah, guess yeah. The, the murders yeah. and assaults and the looting <laughs> and the tens of thousands of terrorized citizens must all be this Marxist uh, organization and not the movement, right? Um, but so I, I, you know, the, the issue that you get into, I think, with the identity politics stuff is that it's like, okay, um, I, like personally, I, it depends on how you define identity politics, I suppose. That's, I don't that's care, the big thing. I don't yeah. care about anything that promotes liberty. I don't care if you consider if it's identity politics that promotes liberty or anti-identity politics that promotes liberty. I don't care. I don't care about democracy or dictatorship. I care about liberty. 
If there was a dictator who rose up tomorrow and said, we're going to free up the markets and respect private property rights, I think that would be great. Now, I don't think that's very likely that it's going to happen, but I'm just making the point that my goal is liberty. It's not like the, the whatever means will get us there, I think is good. Now, of course, not means that would violate liberty. Let me, but, let me but, but, give you an example and, sure. and see what you think, because I know what my answer is to this. Now, this isn't something that I would pursue and push forward but let's say you were you were a senator or something right and a bill and you didn't push for this it just comes across there's a vote to say we're going to cancel taxes completely on black people and that's it mm -hmm. do you vote for it i say yes i i say yes percent yeah one hundred percent you literally couldn't stop me from hitting that button before you were done with the question if you tied my arms i would headbutt the button right in front of me <laughs> yes i would care like i don't care and yes there is something that's unfair about it it's identity politics but as the it's going to drive ron a lot paul, of conflict sure yeah. but as the great ron paul said and i love this is one of my favorite one of the uh less um remembered ron paul debate moments but one of the best ones ever was when he said they said to him in 2012 because mitt romney had i think said that dumbass thing or something like that or maybe it was before that but they go you know there's 40 percent of americans that's nearly yeah. half of americans don't pay federal income tax doesn't that seem a little bit unfair and he goes i think we're halfway there yeah <laughs> I just that was a great go. yes if you can that if you can uh the less money the government is stealing i don't care what group it's for the better to me the problem that you get with uh, saying that you're, um, you know, against identity politics, and I understand why you guys have that in your plank, and I, I, I think that it's, um, it clears up a lot of problems in, in, in many well, ways. I can, I can tell you exactly what our motivation was because it wasn't, it was well thought out, and and why it's there, because we, well, one, things were a little bit different in 2015 to 2016. I would say there was a moment where there was a cause for concern. You know, like when Molly changed, when Alex Jones changed, when Chase Rachel's changed, when all this shit. I mean, people went fucking crazy in 2015. Mm -hmm. It really sucked. And and um, so there was an issue in the party with that for, I would say, 15, 16. And but at the same time, the since then, especially the party has been, I would say, subsumed by the opposite, the SJW culture. So oh, we no understand. Yeah, totally. And and so but we understood that one, we stood against that, that that we are here to change that, that that's a big part of the cultural problem that's keeping the movement out of the party that and that we wanted to fight against that and plant the flag, even though that and, and that even though there's not really at least not anymore uh, any kind of right wing identitarian threat in the party, if it was going to be there, especially in the beginning, they would try us, you know, and and we have to stand against that as well, even though that might only affect us in a small way. And it's not a, 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 a problem uh, across the wider culture, the way that in, within the party, the way that the SJW problem is. And then this enables us to to work with everybody because nobody wants that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like nobody. And, and, and it's gotten to the point where where the, the wheat has separated itself from the chaff in the party, the complete nut jobs, the complete loser, like five star general loser brigaders. Are, are, are seen as, as just that. Whereas yes. people who might have been on the fence and people, uh, you know, who might have thought badly at us at first, but now that they see we're like, you know, we're, we're spending $15,000 on local level candidates and all this shit. And, and now they can look at it and say, all right, well, you know what? I don't agree, but I can work with them. And that's, we have to form these working relationships. So I would sure. say opposing both sides accomplishes that. No, and I understand where you're coming from. I also just think that it's like, Look, you have to understand like kind of what developed in the country. And it really didn't start in 2015 or 16. It really started around 2013, 2014, where the social justice warrior thing went out of control. It got out of control to a like cartoonish level that is it, it's out of something that if it was in a novel, you would be like, I, I can't actually believe this plot. This doesn't make any sense. The country uh, re-elected the first black president. Barack Obama won his election and then was re-elected. And then in response to that, the, the radical social justice left decided that the country was more racist than it had ever been. And they were going to turn up from eight 
to 30, the lecturing white people and making every, I mean, even people, right, who have a, a problem with, say, Stefan Molyneux, he is so much less identitarian than your average, you know, like <laughs> left wing college student who will who will very blatantly explain to you that everything revolves around racial identity, sexual identity, you know, all of that stuff. That so now I don't know Chase Rachel's at all. I've literally never read anything he's ever said. I've I've heard of him. I know he had the falling out with like the Mises Institute guys and all that stuff. I don't know how identitarian he is, but in terms of anyone who actually has a following, from my perspective. It seems like almost nobody who's even in the libertarian world is half as identitarian as those guys. And the other thing is that those types, and th this is why I've never understood the idea that there's an alt-right problem in the libertarian party, is that those types, like I, I wonder sometimes if the loser brigade have ever like even taken 10 minutes to look into what the alt-right is. Those guys right. have absolutely no interest in not only the libertarian party, but the libertarian label. They Their criticism is that li libertarianism in general is like weak. Like basically uh, it, it ranges from being like a Jewish conspiracy to undermine, you know, white men's success in the worst case. And then in the best case, it's just kind of pandering bullshit that isn't strong enough to win the day but there's nobody no one who considers themselves alt-right who has any interest in joining me on this journey to support jacob <laughs> hornberger like that's just the, the, the idea yeah. of it is 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 absolutely absurd but to them what they call alt-right is anybody who might like like any libertarian who if they said like do you know how scary it is to be a black person you know like walking the streets today or something and they went well actually the numbers are this they're like that's that's you being yeah. an alt-right nazi so to them thomas I al thomas al is all right yeah. yes yes like yeah. literally any of these people all basically to them any libertarian who has a following is probably considered a paleocon or something like that. But I just, I don't think it matches up to reality. So there's one other thing I wanted to ask here. Well, not like, kind of address because I think this was the other, there was one other thing that I think caused a little friction. And this goes back, I totally understand it personally. Um, and, but I think this goes back to roles. Um, you, you had made the comment recently that you were, you were questioning whether you were going to vote for Joe Jorgensen. And I, I'll tell you up front, I don't care if you vote for Joe Jorgensen. I mean, I'm, I'm going to vote for Joe Jorgensen. I think I think there is a blue pill thing there. Uh, and and But she's libertarian and blue pill, which is better than not libertarian and blue pill, which is what the what has been going on oh, for okay. a while. Yeah. And, and um, so I do think that that is a, a positive step forward. Uh, I think changing the policy aspects is, is we always knew that changing the policy or principal aspects was going to be easier than changing the cultural aspects. So I do want to reward that forward progress. I do want to uh, maintain working relationships, let's say. However, going back to roles, you represent the movement. You know what I mean? Like you're a voice for the movement who is actively disgusted by the party. And I think that because because the kind of people who got upset with you about that, they're people who, you know, I mean, I was out in 100 degree weather getting signatures. I was out people. Oh, I don't want to answer the door. I was out there when every single person that has a love is love. Uh, you know, science is real. And all, every single those people will not sign a signature. Um, <laughs> every single one of them. Um, you know, I was out there. I've, I've gotten signatures. I've done all the work in the party. I'm invested, too. But I think that's kind of where the, the cross is, is that some of the people that got upset are people who were really, like you said, invested in the party and they couldn't imagine why you would say that. So I just want to give a chance to, to have you address our audience on that and why everything's OK. You know what I mean? Like everything is OK. Well, listen, I mean, uh, as as much as I appreciate, to, uh, you know, the idea of thinking of myself as some type of kingmaker, this my support or, or lack of it is not going to make the difference between Joe Jorgensen, you know, getting more votes than Gary Johnson or less votes than Gary Johnson. That's going to happen on its own. I mean, I could maybe at the the absolute height of my, you know, uh, um, like influence move like. 40, 50,000 votes one way or the other, but that's not going to be a huge deal uh, in the difference of, uh, of the vote total. What I'm addressing is where this, this ticket is really blowing it. 
when they have a really good opportunity. Like, the, the, look, I, I think what people don't understand, right, is that like this is this is not a game. Th this country is on a suicide mission, and the answer to save it is liberty. And when somebody is, they have this title of libertarian candidate for president of the United States, they are now the standard bearer de facto of libertarianism. And so if I see them blowing it, which I do, that, that's what I'm watching, I'm going to tell my people why they're blowing it right now and what the problem is. And there are, so, listen, obviously they're much, uh, Joe and Spike are much more libertarian than uh than gary johnson and bill weld uh and and they're a lot smarter than than those two guys are no question about it however things have changed a lot from 2016 to, to 2020 and truthfully speaking things had already changed by 2016 and gary johnson and bill weld ran a campaign like it was 2012 like what's the difference i mean what was the different thing that gary johnson would have said in 2016 compared to 2012 pretty much nothing but the he repeated a lot had, of the things <laughs> yeah but the culture had drastically changed and he didn't address any of that which is almost okay but the problem is that right now you have joe jorgensen and spike cohen now i don't think joe really is uh, th this represents how she feels it certainly represents how spike feels but the people around joe the people writing her speeches the people running her twitter account the people running her facebook page are very invested in what I would consider to be the left side of the culture war. And when yeah. I say that, I mean things like Spike Cohen uh, uh, posting about how we are witnessing a transgender genocide when there have been 25 yes. transgender people who have been murdered. How many transgender people have been murdered for being transgender? We don't know. It might be four. Like, we have no idea. It, it, the number is so incredibly low to call it a genocide or the beginning of a genocide, as he called it, is absurd. I, I saw a Spike Cohen video the other day um, where he said uh, um, he was talking about welfare reform. And they asked him uh, what, what his thoughts on welfare reform are. And he said, look, here's the truth, okay? I've gone knocking door to door in project buildings and low income areas. And he goes, the truth is nobody wants to be on welfare. They all just wanna be entrepreneurs and work and the, the government regulations are what keep them from that. And it's like, yeah, that's nice. That's a really nice concept. And I wish we lived in that world. I wish that was reality, but that is a flat out lie. It is a lie. And anybody who's actually like been around the block knows that there are actually a lot of people who are quite happy to game the system. They're quite happy to stay on welfare. In fact, they brag about it. My mother used to work at a fucking child clinic in a hospital in the 90s in, in uh, Washington Heights where you would she would see the she could tell you war stories about how these these mothers would brag about how they had each baby to get their budget up the culture in a, in the hood is really broken and so anyway the the point that i'm getting at with all of this is that uh, there's a whole lot of people out there who are rejecting the social uh justice cultural marxist kind of you know culture bullshit and if you're just going to play to those guys, you're going to turn off this other entire area that won't look. Um, oh, OK, so uh, Tim Poole just recently had on his show. Now, I know this is anecdotal and it's just one person, but he he had this this woman who was a, a ex social justice warrior who said she's voting for Trump. And she said she wanted to vote for Joe Jorgensen. But then she heard Joe Jorgensen talk in this social justice warrior language. Now, this is getting broadcast to hundreds of thousands of people. This isn't a hardcore libertarian like me. This is Tim Pool. He's basically a left wing guy. You can appeal to the left, but the principled people on the left who care about arguments are getting turned off to this shit that Joe and Spike are, are pandering to. So it's, to me, it's just it's the worst it's the worst like strategy you could embark on. And I'm just out here saying what the Libertarian Party candidates are doing, what's so infuriating is they go, let's let's placate to the demographic that is the least 
likely to to uh, side with us. Meanwhile, they wouldn't agree these, with you with that, and that's the the, the well, issue. Well, yes, and okay, yeah. and they're wrong, yeah. and that's the thing is that they're <laughs> fucking wrong. And listen, I know a thing or two about how to spread the message of liberty and how to build up an audience. And the truth is, Spike Cohen and Joe Jorgensen, until they won the nomination, didn't have a fraction of the people listening to them that I have. The only reason they have people even paying attention to them is because they're the candidates, okay? And so this is what they're doing with it now. And I'll tell you that the idea that the, the loser brigade types are so angry at me because I'll have an alt writer or, or someone like that on my podcast and not just screech at them that they're racist the whole time. But you know what I've done that none of those guys will ever do in a million years? I've brought hundreds of people back through the pipeline. Like people who are drifting off into that direction and then go, oh, okay, let me bring you back. And they re and now I personally think that someone who used to be a libertarian who's drifted off into a bad direction is a is a better like like that's more likely yeah. to yield positive results than going after a group of people who you know will never be libertarian. Like and, it's and just impossible. My own anecdote, and then we got to shift gears because we're running out of time. Sure, sure. Um, but I would love to do this again. I'm having fun. Um, but, um, but, uh, my own anecdote is I've, so I live in a, a I mean, it's a town, it's not a huge city, but I, I live in a town of like 60,000 people. I decriminalize weed here. It's not like I worked with the right on that. I worked with a guy who was terribly afflicted with TDS. Uh, and, 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 you know, you don't hear me t like talking like them. It's not like the, the, the psychedelic decriminalization is, is being, uh, movement is being run, run, yeah, run by Republicans it's 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 being run by progressives and a lot of these people who are into the shroom thing they they don't want it to be free market you know what i mean because you know oh it's medicine man like it should be communal we should just share it and yes you should be able to share it, but they don't they don't like profits you know what i mean like and they don't they don't want yeah entrepreneurs you know taking advantage of people for for the profits but my point is, is i still work with them and i've achieved things with them I, and and but you don't see me adopting their language. And in fact, I'm yeah. trying to bring my language to them while at the same time it's being accepting of our differences. And, all, and, I, and I think that's the whole mark of a coalition. Yeah, I agree with you. And all Joe Jorgensen or Spike Cohen would have to do in order to like not alienate the, the whole other side, the whole anti-left. It's not even right. It's just anti-left. Yeah. Like Tim Poole is not right wing. He's no. just anti-left social justice shit. And the only thing they'd have to do, right, is just just in, in that Joe Jorgensen tweet, she, even if she wants to say, I, I'm not just passively, I sh she shouldn't have said we must, but if she wanted to just say, I'm not just passively non-racist, I am anti-racist. I'm against racism and say, I'm against anyone being racist against black people. I'm against anyone being racist toward white people. If she had just said that, you would have none of the outrage about this. It's just that when you live in a culture where anti-white racism is completely acceptable to the point where it's routine, to the point where you can write a book that called white fragility and it can be a bestseller. <laughs> but if you were to even mention, if you were to even say in most corporate jobs, you know, I think this book's kind of anti is racist against white people. You could get fired from your job for that. It's hard when you just come out and then add to that, like, yeah, we're against racism. This is what turns people off. All they need to do is, is just say, like, even if Spike Cohen, like wanted to say something about transgender, listen, no libertarian would care if you say you own your body and whatever you want to do with your body, you can, you can identify as whatever you want to, and you should never experience violence for what, how you want to live your life. But also other people, people aren't forced to accept you for that lifestyle and that's the deal you have to make like that, i'd be standing up cheering if he said that but that's not so what they're saying we're really com coming up on time so i got one more question i'll add my one last anecdote and this is when i knew that me and maj were going to get together very well or get along very well it was the first time i talked to him i didn't know his disposition yet you know what i mean or anything like that so i kind of tread lightly and and said like you know how do we deal with the like democrat by default thing and he was just point blank like, you need people like me. Without people like me, uh, you're, you're swimming up against a lot of anti-white racism and like your, your free market shit just sounds like Republicans and no one cares. Yeah. It's like, okay, yeah, I know. And, and, and <laughs> like, but that, that frankness, that irreverence, that, that, that honesty, 
you know, there, there's so much lack of that. But all right. So the last the, the last thing that I want to get to you, uh, radical shift in gears. This is Ron Paul's 85th birthday. This is in part a, uh, a honoring Ron Paul thing. We're asking everybody, what was your favorite memory of the Ron Paul revolution? I'm going to share mine with Tom. Um, OK, so my you know, honestly, if I like it's not even a moment. What I what I miss about the year 2008, uh, the year 2009, 2010, was that every day I would go to YouTube and YouTube Ron Paul and then search by date added, uh, upload date or whatever it was back then, and just get the newest thing. It was like, what was the newest thing he had said? What was the yep. newest thing? And every interview, every speech – you knew he was going to be saying like exactly what we wanted our leader to say. And, and it's not that he was perfect. Like there were some things where, you know, you'd certainly someone, someone said recently in the, uh, in the Facebook group was that they, they go, uh, they were like, Dave, you're so hard on, on Joe Jorgensen, but you got to understand nobody's Ron Paul. No one's going to have his charisma. And I thought it was so funny that they said they go, Ron Paul, it's not his charisma. <laughs> like, it's his courage. That was, that, yes. That was the thing that you'd actually be, oh, you know, he's like me in the sense that like he like kind of stutters and says things in weird ways sometimes. And you're like, oh, that's not the most eloquent way to say it. What Ron Paul's thing was, it was his knowledge and his courage to tell the truth. And the thing that I like try, this is what was the heart of my message in the Sarwak debate. It's the heart of my message to all of the people in the Mises caucus and to the rest of the Libertarian Party. It's that the only time we ever had a real movement geared toward liberty in this country was when we had a leader who would speak up and just say something that might get him booed out of the arena that he was in. And he knew that he might get booed out and often did get booed out of, uh, off that stage. And he was okay with that. He was like, you know what? I'm going to tell the truth. And if, if everybody wants to call me names, and he got called all the names in the book, and he just took it with a smile. And you know what? He loved his life. He loved his wife. He loved his kids. <laughs> he didn't care. It was like, I'm fine. I'll go back to them. I've got that's, everything that's, I need. Yes, yeah, that's, that's security. What I, yeah. That's what I try. Like, I, I try because he's my hero. I try to live that way. And I think that's the best way for everyone else to live. And if we actually want to do something here, if it's not just spinning our wheels and just about like, let me win this Twitter exchange or something like that. That's what it's going to take. It's going to take that real courage. It's going to take just tell the truth as you see it. And if people want to call you names, that's fine. And and just be be strong. It, none of this really matters. This doesn't mean anything. If someone tweets something mean at me, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go play with my daughter and hang out with my wife. Aaron just had a bomb ass <laughs> meal that his wife cooked him. Like none of this is this is just a battle of ideas. And this is what men do. Men like say what they mean and they and they stick by their principles. And uh, I say yeah. thank you to both of you guys for all the great work that you do. And anytime you want to talk, I'm here. Yeah, man, you. I'm having like I said, I'm having fun. And same same thing with this guy, man. It's the courage. The courage is is what is hell yeah. <laughs> the courage, but beyond the intellectual stuff, it's 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 courage. That is the the thing, if you ask me. It's it's the into honesty, the consistency, the integrity, and the courage. Yes. But um, all right. Well, Dave, thank you so much for coming, everybody. The the great, the fantastic, the illustrious <laughs> Dave Smith signing off. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys. All right. Bye. Bye, Dave. Oh, I had a lot of fun with that one. Yeah, he's. I uh, have to. Go I back feel like and, I loosened up. I feel like I had a couple beers. I'm yeah. gonna have to go back and listen to the that um, I came back about. 7 30. Um, I do have an announcement. Uh, we're giving away our fourth silver round, uh, adding to the list of Austin Walter in Indiana, Christian Gruber in California, and Nathan Peer in Texas. We're adding Joseph Garcia from North Carolina. He won the oh, nice. fourth silver awesome. round. So we got uh, somebody from uh, uh, the Southeast and uh, we had a Kentucky person earlier too. Uh, we haven't had anybody up your way or New England yet, so maybe it's going to be Emily them. on that year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's gonna... yeah. Um, so uh, what you need to do: lpmesiscaucus.com/slash/donate. There's still time to get entered for the the last silver round drawing, and of course, the drawing for the AR-15 rifle that we're going to do toward the end of the nine o'clock hour uh, after we're done speaking with Tom Woods. So go there now. I will, you know, refresh and, and get the, um, 
each hour at the top of the hour. And then uh, maybe around nine 30 or so I'll do it again to make sure everybody let's just, let's just put nine 30 as the cutoff date uh, time. I'll download them and we'll select the winner by random number generator. And uh, somebody will be very happy and we'll be happy if you uh, we're almost to 400. Uh, uh, I think it. Yeah, uh, actually we're really close. We're, we're at 386. Let me refresh. 300, yeah, 386. We're over $5,100 a month. Uh, so 14 more by the end of the night. Well, let's say 15, 15 more. Let's get over fi- uh, 400. So and, and, five, go ahead. And we should be able to get it with uh, Scott Horton and Tom Woods uh, uh, as our final two guests. So anything else we need to say before we take a little break and get ready for Scott? No, just remember all the stuff that we have available. You know, if you become a recurring donor, you're, you're getting the work, you're getting the organization, go to the meet the team page, look at how huge our team is, how many people we've got doing this work, go to Mises merch, look at the shirts that we offer, go to decentralized revolution, look at the content that we offer. You know, we've got, uh, ask an back, submit your questions. We will have your, your, your economics questions answered by professionals, uh, instead of us armchair, uh, Austrians over at the Mises Institute. And we're trying to do everything that we can to, to provide you guys with content, to provide you guys with, with work, uh, uh, advancing freedom in a decentralist manner and, and, making the, and pointing the Libertarian Party in that Austro-Libertarian decentralist direction. And another thing we're doing, of course, is it's, it's campaign season. We are, uh, we've already supported to the tune of $1,500 each, three candidates uh, one, uh, Kish Morrow in, in California, and then Marcos and uh, Andre down in Florida. We want to get that number to at least 10. And uh, we're on the way to doing that, to having the, the funds to, to do that. And because uh, uh, that, after all, what other caucus, what other part of the Libertarian Party is giving this type of money and support to uh, to great candidates? So. All right, we'll we'll say goodbye, and uh, we'll be back with uh, Scott Horton in about five minutes. Cool.